Welcome to Closure Island. I hope you're having a fantastic time. Closure Island is a group of closure enthusiasts and anyone interested in functional programming. We get together to discuss closure, functional programming, and technology in general. All skill levels and backgrounds are welcome, so don't feel intimidated. There's a lot to learn when it comes to closure and functional programming. My name is Samir, and in today's presentation, I'm going to talk about science and engineering. So stay tuned. Welcome back, folks. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Samir, and in today's presentation, I'm going to talk about science and engineering. As a disclaimer, uh, all the materials in this talk is based on my own research and experience, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, I'm not good with graphics in general, but I created this picture to kind of uh, show my understanding of the world around me. In my world, uh, science on the left sits alone. It interacts with uh, applied science closely and applied science is a superset of uh, some other fields like engineering, medicine, and some other stuff. And on the right, we have art and superstitions. Art has some overlaps with superstition, engineering, applied science, and the same goes for superstition. It has an uh, it has over overlaps with uh, engineering, applied science, and art. Since uh, we are in Closure Ireland and we have to stay true to our traditions, I have to start by looking at the definition of different words in the dictionary. So Merriam-Webster defines science as uh, like these three uh, definitions, but the one I like the most is the last one. Science from the Latin words uh, scientia, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, meaning knowledge, is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in, in the form of testable explanations and predict, uh, predictions about the universe. So the key word here is testable explanations. And keep it in mind, we're going to use it a lot throughout this talk. But what is applied science? Applied science is the application of ex uh, existing scientific knowledge to practi uh, practical applications like technology or inventions. And by this definition, we can clearly see that engineering and medicine are subsets of uh, applied science. Pra basically, uh, the application of science in our daily life would be applied science. And engineering. Engineering uh, is derived from the Latin, for, uh, Latin word ingenium, meaning cleverness. Engineering is the use of scientific principles to design and build machines, structures, and other items. Um, as you can see, I uh, kind of uh, Showed, showed you uh, some of the keywords that are important in the engineering definition. Scientific principles, uh, to, like an engineer uses scientific pr principle to build something. That's the core uh, definition of an engineer. But what is superstition? Superstition is any belief or practice based upon one's trust in luck or any other irrational, unscientific, or supernatural forces. Often it arises from ignorance, uh, misunderstanding of science, uh, and blah, blah, blah. And the, as you can see, one of the, like, there's several keywords in super, the definition of superstition. Irrational, unscientific, or misunderstanding of science. So, if science is all about te uh, testable explanations of the world. Superstition, by definition, is based upon unscientific and ir irrational or misunderstanding of science. So we can kind of understand that superstition is, based on, is not based on testable uh, ex explanations. And finally, art. 
uh art is very subjective i'm not an expert i decide a little bit about music i don't know much about art so i have to res reserve judgment i have to leave it to the expert so as uh, as we saw in from the definitions uh, science and engineering are uh, sh share a lot together and they're kind of two sides of the same coin scientific uh, scientists uh, constantly try to discover principles of the universe and try to discover laws that governing the universe. Engineers then use those principles to build new technologies, new tools, or refine the previous technologies. And then scientists again uh, can utilize those uh, those new technologies to gain better understanding of our universe and find more principles and laws. And this loop continues. That's um, how engineering and science are really like close to each other. That's why I said they are two sides of the same coin. Again, I'm really bad with graphics, but I created this kind of a uh, schematic of how science works and how applied science or other fields of engineering works in relation uh, to science if we assume that every ring in this picture um, kind of represents a scientific field for example at the core we might have physics or quantum mechanics and as we go uh, out of this picture out of these rings we might have other field like scientific fields that are kind of based on uh, the layers inside of them like chemistry or biology or stuff like that and those colorful regions are different fields of applied science or engineering as you can see in my idea uh, every different like every engineering field might have some overlaps might use some of the science related to that area like no engineering field has to like has an overlap with every science out there so it's kind of clear that as engineers we need to know more about the uh, scientific like the scientific principles that are uh, governing our field of uh, engineering we build technologies uh, by using these uh, scientific principles and the right set of tools and we should have a better understanding of the uh, science that we use in our field every day and it might sound really simple but that's actually the key to become a better engineer we should be able to uh, use scientific workflows in our day-to-day -day jobs to solve a problem or uh, choose the right tool uh, or stuff like that just knowing how to use a tool doesn't make us engineers. For example, just knowing how to program make, just makes us programmers, not engineers. Or just know how, how to build a wall doesn't make us architects. To show you an example, um, here's a video. Um, let me play it, actually. Here's a video. I couldn't find a better quality video, uh, by the way. This is the Millennium, uh, Millennium Bridge of London, I guess, uh, um, in early 2000s. So as you can see, when people are walking on the bridge, it, it's kind of, the bridge is shaking and it's like, it's wobbly. The reason for that is by when the pedestrians like walks on the bridge, they kind of uh, synchronize their steps together, left, right, left, right. And that motion creates a frequency that is close to the resonance frequency of the bridge itself. So the architect of this bridge knew how to actually design a bridge, create a bridge. He knew how to use tools, but he missed something really fundamental. He, of, of course, I'm just guessing here. He wasn't uh, familiar with probably with the resonance frequency of buildings or any object in the universe. So 
that was really dangerous as far as i know they shut down the bridge to fix it and what could happen was if uh, the frequency of uh, pedestrians get like exactly the same as the resonance frequency of the bridge it it might have been, uh, collapsed and basically that's why buildings destroy get destroyed uh, during an earthquake in this example we can see that knowing the scientific principles of our field is really important especially uh, when it comes to uh, things like buildings and human lives so to be better engineers we need to understand the scientific principles and our tools better but let's start by the scientific side of things all of us has an uh, inner scientific inside of us in order to become better engineers we need to improve our inner scientists but how can we do that the first and the most important thing is to ask questions is to be skeptical and have a scientific mind during the islamic golden era i guess it was uh, during 10 and 11th century ac there was a islamic scholar called ibn al-haytham uh, many modern scientists know this guy as the first scientist kind of he he kind of wrote down the principles of a scientist like the r rules and laws that a scientist needs to follow i really like this paragraph it basically describes scientists it's too long to read it but you can find it on my website there's a code of honor i have this in there but to summarize it we uh, scientists should actually ask questions should question everything if we read something we have to question that like we have to question ourselves everyone every idea and we need to just believe in evidence and that's the scientist that's the principle of being a scientist excuse me So, in order to be a better scientist, we need to learn the official language of science. This one doesn't apply to this group because uh, we are at Closure Ireland and English is the like, official language of this group. But for those people who are not native English speakers, we have to understand that uh, right now, English is the language of science. It used to be Arabic during the Islamic uh, golden era, then it was Latin, and now it's English. Uh, we shouldn't rely on translated texts and materials because in order, like when someone translates something from English to other languages, it gets uh, some time to translate that stuff. And usually it's opinionated even like Translators might not uh, be aware of it, but sometimes they are biased towards some things. So in the process of translation, they make some changes, which makes the text opinionated. And finally, uh, math is the language of the universe. Every engineer has to know mathematics to some degree. I put three asterisks there because like whenever I tell this to anyone, they reply back with something like, yeah, I studied math in, the, in college or university. I don't see the point. Uh, I never used it in my field. Why should I learn math and things like that? Unfortunately, um, universities teach everything to the students, including mathematics. But the only thing that they miss is usually is that they don't tell them don't uh, they don't tell the students why math or any other subject is important to them like how they might use it in their daily lives how how that science or how mathematics would help them to live their lives uh, differently as an example uh, during the world war there was a 
famous mathemat uh, mathematicians called Abraham Waltz. If I'm not mistaken, he was from Hungary. He moved to US. He was really famous for problem uh, problem solving. You might seen you might have seen this uh, picture a lot. This is a picture from a fighter, uh, like an airplane from world, uh, from the World War. Basically, what happens was some days uh, some people from U.S. Air Force uh, Air Force went to uh, Mr. Wall to ask uh, for his help. Since he was really famous problem solver, they asked him, "Yeah, we have uh, many." fighters that come back from uh, the battlefield and as you can see in this picture all of them have tons of uh, bullet holes on their body we want to equip the airplane with some armor but we don't know what's the best distribution of the armor on the airplane so basically if the arm like if we put too much armor on the plane the fuel usage would like be more and if we use less armor, they would like sh destroy the. They, there's a, like a higher chance of the fighter getting destroyed in the battlefield. And they they were looking uh, for the. They they wanted Mr. Wall to tell them what would be the uh, f most efficient uh, armor distribution. So, Wall actually told them that you need to cover your uh, engine. Put all the armor you have on the engine and they replied that mm, that doesn't seem right because the bullet holes are more spread across the body like especially at the in, in the center we don't get uh, uh, hit a lot on the engine all the fighters have more bullets on the body on the center of the body and it might be, it might seem really uh, seem really uh, easy to you, but Mr. Wald replied that yeah, your data set is not right because you you are collecting data based on all the fighters that come back, but you like you have tons of fighters that never come back. They get destroyed in the battlefield. They get hit in the engine and they never come back. If you put the armor on the engine, you're going to have more. Uh, airplanes coming back and as you can see it was like a really easy answer but this is actually what I mean by mathematics mathematics is not about numbers only about numbers I mean there's some branches of mathematics that involved with numbers like number theory or different calculus but in many other branches you don't see any trace of numbers Mathematics is all about abstractions, to create abstractions, to solve a problem. Mathematics is all about problem solving. And that's like an engineer has to develop some mathematical thinking. Uh, an engineer should be able to reason about some problem that uh, they're trying to solve in a mathematical fashion. And that brings us to scientific literacy. As an engineer, we need to be able to explain a phenomena scientifically. Um, for example, for as a software engineer, when something goes wrong, we should be able to describe the problem in a scientific manner. We have to be able to evaluate and design some uh, scientific observation, interpret the data that we get from the evidence, uh, from the experiments and collect some uh, scientific evidence analyze the data and claim some arguments and reach some conclusion at the end we have to be able to communicate with evidence and numbers it's really hard to uh, collect uh, evidence right evidence to design an experience experiment sorry we have to know that numbers never lie. If we if we have a right calculation, if we have correct experience experiment, and our tests are correct, then numbers won't lie. As an example, uh, I'm going to tell you like a short story. Uh, a gentleman called Peter Drac, uh, Peter Drac or Paul Drac, I can't remember uh, his first name. He's a really famous, he was a really famous physicist uh, from early 2000 century, sorry, 
20th century uh, around 1930s uh, I guess he was working on a, a problem he tried to solve a problem and during his calculation he did some calculation and he ended up with a uh, with two answers something like uh, just uh, like a example I don't know the exact calculation he reached to a result of x equals to absolute value of 2 as an example so x in that calculation would be either minus 2 or 2 but the interpretation of his calculation and the result he got was that if we have electron then there should be some other particle with the same uh, attributes as an electron but, but with a different charge but since it wasn't known back then he didn't believe the numbers he tried to solve the problem over and over again using different methods different approaches and like he used different techniques uh, tons of peer review as as he puts it it was a like a painful three years and after three years of calculation he ended up with the same re uh, same numbers and result over and over again so he actually after three years he published a paper and claimed that if we have electron there should be another particle same attributes different spin and different charge and he named it positron and after a few years uh, they discovered antimatter and positron and we know that it exists today and that's how he discovered antimatter and basically I, I think that's a beautiful example because if we do everything right numbers never lie to us and we can't rely on them as, a, as an engineer we should be able to use scientific workflows like create an observation like a scientific observation uh, think about an interesting question or a different aspect of uh, the data we got from the observation formulate some hypothesis uh, develop some experiments and predictions gather like apply the experiment gather data refine our hypothesis and uh, finally after several iteration develop some theory and this loop, loop over continue uh, always continues it might sound a little bit um how can i put this cheesy maybe for uh, engineers or especially software engineers but if you think about it we see that that's actually that can be really useful to us we usually don't do it this way on our daily job if you do it kudos to you that's amazing but we usually don't do it this way but next time you at your job when you're working to, on something you're trying to solve some problem give it a try after a while you'll see uh, the difference you see how uh, actually solid your results would become as an engineer we should be able to follow these scientific workflows and one of the most important uh, aspects of science is that scientific principles are not opinionated whether i like it or not and a scientific fact won't change for uh, to give you an example um, for example like it's not about computer science but in quantum mechanics we have a we have a principle called uh, quantum entanglement it's a crazy idea that two different particles a pair of particles can be uh, entangled together even though they're far far away from each other so classical physics says that nothing travels faster than the speed of light but if we have two particles in two sides of a galaxy and they are entangled to each other an instant change on the first one kind of kind of reveals uh, something about the other particle and that's kind of breaks this principle of class, uh, classical mechanics and many physicists didn't like this but that doesn't make makes any difference whether they liked it or not the fact was fact is that with correct the uh, hypothesis with enough evidence we can reach to a conclusion that quantum entanglement is correct whether i like it or not and that applies to every other uh, scientific principles we have to bear that in mind while we 
uh, working uh, like while we were working as a software engineer. And never forget that superstitious superstition is something really close to us as engineers. Unfortunately, uh, we see superstition in our work quite a lot. For example, any non-scientific uh, beliefs that we have uh, usually might be based on some emotions uh, or uh, like is a superstition. Whatever the company ex uh, creates is the best. Like we see this example quite a lot. Or tool Y is the best because I'm using it or people usually don't say I'm using it, but people have some bias uh, biases around some special tools or technology or anything like that. And we see it a lot. Or I, I read this on on Hacker News, so it got to be true. Or I, for a little bit less technical folks, especially my parents are like that, they read something on a weblog or something. And since they read it on internet, that has to be true. But Obviously, that's uh, that's not the case. These are different types of uh, superstitions that we struggle with every day. And finally, trends. I, this one bothers me a lot. Uh, we get this uh, quite a lot. Everybody is using Z, so it should be the best. To give you a solid example, for example, just this is just an example. Don't I hope I don't uh, offend anyone. JavaScript is the best uh, language ever, or Python is the best language ever because everybody is using it. That's not a scientific thing to say, right? So again, excuse my poor graphics. Uh, I have an idea and I call it uh, the Samir's Pyramid. So basically we have a pyramid here. Um, on the base level, we have people with uh, like an average level of knowledge and below that. And as we go higher on this pyramid, we have more, we have people with more level, like a higher level, a level of knowledge. And at the top, we have some exceptional people uh, who are once in a generation, I don't know, like Isaac Newton or Einstein, Stephen Hawking and people like that. Um, so my idea is when like on each level, people have a certain grasp and certain understanding of the world around them. Their knowledge is limited. Uh, and when they, imp like, when they gain more knowledge, they move up uh, f like a level to, uh, le level by level, they move up the pyramid. But let's assume on the base, uh, on the base level, people talk about a language called X. They say, yeah, X is the best language ever, or, the better since we're in Closure Ireland, everyone in uh, in the base uh, layer talks about object oriented programming. And since there are so many people in the base, uh, base level, it would become a trend. So object oriented would be a trend. Everyone talks about it, but they talk about it because they understand it. They don't talk about something that they might not understand. But when we move uh, like a little bit higher in the pyramid, people who understand, like for example, functional programming, they would like they have enough knowledge to understand why programming line. Oh, sorry, functional programming is might be better than ob object oriented programming. It doesn't have to be a scientific guess yet. But we're talking about the society and like uh, not everyone have enough scientific literacy in a society. I hope that they come, uh, that, uh, but right now, everyone has a different understanding of their environment. And if let's say on the very first level, on the highest level, only few people talk about a new methodology called, I don't know, like fruit programming, for example, then that's because they can understand that fruit programming. On, on the middle level, we might talk about like functional programming and on a little bit lower level, people might still use imperative languages or stuff like that. But whatever people in the first, in the like a lowest uh, level talk about, it becomes a trend. It doesn't make it true. 
it's a trend because like so many people talk about it but there's no scientific uh rationale or reasoning behind it to support that trend and as a scientist as a like a someone who tries to improve every day i always try to find people in higher levels and to figure out what do they talk about like what is the trend in that specific le level I, I should be able to understand that to improve i have to improve my knowledge to actually be able to understand like to move up a uh, level and that's the idea behind trends in my opinion and my idea uh, doesn't a trend doesn't make something true so I can actually uh, skip this one. We have we don't have enough time uh, to summarize. There's a difference between fact, theory, and hypothesis. Facts are solid and unbreakable, like testable explanation of the world. Uh, the keyword that we saw in the sci uh, science definition. Theories have a strong evidence, but some corner cases. That means like usually they need some tweaks to become a fact. Hypotheses are just some scientifically literate guesses that need to be verified. They, we need to run experiments to verify them. And the rest are just feelings and hunches, ideas, and stuff like that. Um, but facts and feelings are, like, are kind of really uh, hard to draw, draw the line, you know? We we get to see this discussion all the time that language A is better than language B. Whenever I like I see, uh, see these kind of discussions or when whenever someone uh, tells me this, I ask some questions. Why language A is better? Do you have a proof? In what aspect? How was your test environment? And things uh, to that nature. Uh, to reach to a scientific discussion and to reach to a, like a scientific fact rather than I feel that language A is better. Or so some people, like uh, we see that a lot as well, we have to use the, these, this new methodology to um, rock our product or some other example to this sort. And the other aspect that we engineers are heavily tied to is tooling. Like we use tools and in order to be better engineers, we need to know our tools better. Not just uh, like the first one was scientific principles of our field. And the second one is our tools. So we have to understand that different tools gives us, uh, give us different uh, options. Tools are... Uh, just tools we, we don't have to be uh, emotionally attached to them unfortunately we see uh, this quite a lot in uh, software engineering world as well like some stuff beco uh, becomes a cult and people worship a technology or something which is wrong it's not scientific it's based on superstition we need to be able to choose the right tool for the right uh, problem and we need to be able to choose our tools scientifically as well in order to choose a tool scientifically, we can come up with a, a list of requirements. We need to design some experiment, collect some data. Speaking about our uh, field, we have to uh, run some experiment, write some code for our test, uh, some tests and collect some metrics. And then based on those numbers and some non-technical requirements, we might have like the budget and stuff like that. We can get to a scientific conclusion and choose the right tool for uh, the problem at hand. We need to uh, leave our uh, prejudice uh, aside when we uh, try to do scientific work. Uh, and we need to do uh, more experiment to eliminate uh, errors. Uh, to give you an uh, uh, example of incorrect uh, experiment and how we can actually mess it up, a while back, like a long ago, I, I saw this chart on a web blog. There was a, like a post on Hacker News, I guess. And the author was claiming that, yeah, Swift is the best language ever. Look at this chart. But he didn't mention what this chart is like or what was his test environment? What was the program he wrote to test 
uh, different languages or like for example what was the program in ruby to compete with other languages or things to that nature and people started to point out the same thing to him and ask him to provide more information and as it turns out there was a huge miss in the experiment which made this uh, chart invalid but i see i see this quite a lot these days people put some charts in a or, uh, in a blog post or a, like a paper or something not papers pa papers usually get peer reviewed and uh, are uh, they're kind of robust but blog posts we see so much of these kind of charts just because there's a chart there doesn't make it true it doesn't make it a like a scientific uh work or anything to that sort actually we need to do the right experiment and uh design our experiment correctly incorrect experiment can actually have uh huge impact in our work and obviously in our scientific conclusion incorrect experiment uh, might be because of uh, wrong attributes biased factors incorrect me measurement not enough randomization and one of the most important thing is inaccurate measurement tools i remember to give you an example i remember a while back there was a questionnaire uh, somewhere and somebody asked well, yeah, they try to come up with a factor to describe productivity and part of that questionnaire was how happy you are with the current process blah 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 it was on a project and there was like a if i remember correctly it was like zero being like i'm not happy with the process at all five being like i'm super happy and based on the data they got from the questionnaire they tried to model the productivity of that project to try to like make some optimization but there was a, like a huge miss there there was a, I, I like to kind of categorize it as inaccurate measurement tool like develop uh, developer happiness is not something that actually reflect the scientific world it's it's so subjective right if i get to i i always use this uh, example if i uh, get a pizza from that foundation who runs the project i would be a super happy engineer like i would like say five i'm super happy with the uh, workflow right but does it really matter if i'm happy or not because it's subjective to whether i get a pizza or not it doesn't it doesn't have any scientific value at all this uh, like this one a real uh, this one was a real uh, example and things to this nature counts as like can kind of break the experiment and gives us uh, gave us some uh, wrong data in order to avoid that there's a paper called fisher's principle that green thing is a link i'm going to put the uh, link to the slide deck in the description uh this paper is kind of very famous everyone uh, every scientist kind of knows about this they everyone used this paper as the foundation of how to design an experiment i highly recommend you to have a look at this one to try different experiment like when you you're designing an experiment to collect data this can save you a lot of time and finally we need to understand that everything is a trade-off especially in computer science we need to understand the trade-off we need to understand that trade-offs usually go multiple ways uh, to give you an example we often uh, hear that people says blah 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 is the fastest programming language in the world beside other things that are wrong with this statement i can't stop thinking that okay let's assume fastest is the right terminology here because like speed is relative uh fastest in uh, like fastest relative to what right beside that i can't stop thinking that if it's the fastest what's the catch like wh what's the trade-off it, it is when it's fastest there's a the trade-off it should be like there should be something to balance it off right to give you a better example this is a pseudo chart 
uh, which we have on the x-axis, we have the knowledge required to um, implement different concurrency models. And on the y-axis, we have the quality of the of that uh, concurrency model. And each green spot uh, is a, like a different concurrency model. Take point A, for example. It doesn't need a, like advanced level of knowledge to implement it but it has a poor uh, quality as well. So mm, it has a poor quality, but it makes sense for some situations, right? Because it doesn't need a, like a advanced level, level of knowledge. And on the other hand, point B uh, needs a, like a really advanced knowledge base, but it has an amazing quality. What is quality and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, those are like valid questions, but it's a pseudo chart. And my point is, just because P is up there and A is down there doesn't make, like, we can't really compare them. It's a trade-off. We have to choose the right tool for the right problem. Or, like, it depends on the situation, uh, A might be, a, like, a better choice than P. In conclusion, to become better engineers, we need to have, a, a, like, a mentality of a scientist. We should be scientists first and then engineers. We need to be scientifically uh, literate. When we grow as scientists, we become better engineers. We need to use and adapt to scientific workflows on our daily jobs, our lives in general. And finally, um, in my opinion, it's the most important thing to stay away from superstition. But before I uh, finish up my talk, uh, I have a code of honor. I live by my code of honor. It's, you can uh, read it in my website. There's a section about science in my code of honor, which I think it worth sharing with you folks as well. That's why I put, uh, I created a slide for just for my uh, scientific code of honor. It like, the first thing, as I mentioned earlier, is to question the authorities. No idea is true just because someone says so. That includes me. That's why I put that disclaimer in, uh, in my slides, uh, very first slide. No idea is true because someone said so. We need to always follow the evidence wherever it leads to. Nullius in verba, which is the Latin for roughly translates to uh, don't believe in words or see it for yourself, think for yourself and question yourself. Don't believe in anything just because you want to believe, uh, just because you want to. Believing something doesn't make it so. It's really uh, like I feel this one uh, really closely, especially about software engineering. Uh, we need to test our ideas and uh, test our ideas by evidence gained from uh, observation and experience. If a favorite idea failed a well-designed test, it's wrong. Get over it. I used to be a, I used to be really biased toward one uh, specific technology long, long ago, and it was really hard for me to see it fails, uh, it, like it failing in di in different. Uh, Fields basically, yeah. It was a programming language. I was really biased. I couldn't uh, tolerate the fact that it's not good I, because of my bias. I didn't want to uh, believe that it's not good, and it was hard for me to move on. But luckily, I did, and I learned. Uh, I learned this that it doesn't matter what I like or what what I don't. It's all about science. If if something passed the design well designed test it's good otherwise it's not good it's it's wrong i have to get over it and move on we need to follow the evidence wherever it leads if you have no evidence reserve judgment this is really important especially in our uh, field and finally and the most important of all remember you could be wrong even the best uh, scientists have been wrong about something every great scientist in the history make mistake made mistakes and obviously, uh, of course, they did because all of us are human and it's in our nature. 
But the good thing is science keeps us from uh, fooling ourselves and each other. I hope uh, this talk uh, wasn't uh, closure related, but I hope uh, it was useful. If you have any question, please, please uh, reach out to me. You can find my uh, contact information in uh, my website, lexamir.com. And thank you. Um, it was an honor uh, to give uh, this presentation, and I hope to see you in person in Closure Island.